Hello and welcome to another episode of Once a Warrior. My name is Montebeth and I'm joined by the man affectionately known as Happy Frank. Frank Endicott, thanks for joining me, man. Pleasure, Monty. Great to be here. Are you still happy? Always happy. Always fine. What's keeping you busy, Frank? Um, following our, our racehorse around at the moment, it's keeping me more busy than anything. Um, I'm retired now and, uh, you know, we've got a 10-acre um, plot at home there with a few sheep on, a couple of cows and uh, looking after them. But I do. I, I still do a bit here and there, but it's always at my pace now. Okay, you haven't told us the name of this racehorse. I'm sure they want to know out there. Um, well, I'm I'm one of five owners. Um, Shane is the younger son, and, and three others, and good blokes. And uh, the the filly's name is Millwood Nike. She's uh, happened to one. She's won ten out of ten. Excellent, <laughs> excellent. Okay, let's go back to 1995. Where did you first find out about the Warriors? When did you know it was a thing? Well, it's when I was coaching Canterbury, Monty, and um, we were having a pretty good uh, time of it at that stage. Understatement. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, they called it the killing fields down there. And uh, we hadn't beat Auckland for, um, I think it was 32 years uh, at home. And, uh, and all of a sudden we were unbeaten in five years. So uh, we turned it round and when we win, won the national uh, championship in 93, when um, Owen Wright, the Auckland coach, brought all the superstars five or six of the kiwis from england for it um and it was you know that was half two-thirds of the new zealand test side at the time and we uh, i think we beat them by 40 or 30 or 40 points so that's when i was asked to um, um by john Money and ian robson to um come up to auckland and uh, join the warriors this was a year before it year started before. 94 so we um you know helped put the club together with with john and ian and um Peter McLeod, the chairman at the time, and uh, and of course the other local coach was John Acklin. Um, and uh, we all worked together and um, had it ready for 95. Was it an easy decision? I mean, uh, what was holding you back? Because I know you had a lot of kids early on in terms of four boys that took you away from your rugby league career, so you went into coaching. Um, did you ever think it was going to be professional? No, I didn't. No, not for a minute, Monty. In fact, I was in the printing trade for 28 years, and um, and I was in the printing trade when I was asked. And um, you know, I couldn't uh, I couldn't wait to to give it a crack. It was just too good an opportunity to turn turn down. And it was never about money, uh, ever. It was about you know the enjoyment that went with it. And uh, you know, we ended up here for nine years. I mean, it would have been hard, sort of, coming from a domestic uh, coach, even though you were coaching the Kiwis, uh, to full-time professional with some of these superstars from all around the world, England, Australia. Um, did it make it easy that you were coaching the Kiwis and you knew a few of those players? 100%. I was um, appointed Kiwi coach in 1994, um, the same year as I come up here before the, the, um, the 95 opener. You know, coaching players at the, at the highest level, um, when the English players come in, I knew, I knew some of them anyway, and, and you knew of the Aussies. and. Uh, and it, it, they just come together like a big family, like the Kiwis do. And uh, yeah, it was it was interesting time. It really was because you know, as old as I was, I was still learning too. What was the relationship like with you and John Money? Very good. Couldn't have been better. Um, John, to be fair, and we're talking honest here, had a problem with some players, or players had a problem with him. Sorry. Yeah. And um, um, and I did my best to help John understand the, the New Zealand psyche, the New Zealand players, but sometimes he had that tough Australian attitude mm. and, and, and what he said to them at times didn't really come across and, and upset a few of them, you know? Um, but that's, that's, that's how he was. It was hard for me because, you know, I'm, I'm here with this guy, John Money, who's, who's, who's coached Parramatta and Wigan and to grand final wins, and, and I'm, I'm the new boy on the block, but I adapted well to him, you know. I learnt to, I, I got to know John well um, before I actually started contributing to the football side. Personally, I think I, I could have and I would have liked to have done a lot more, but I didn't want to overstep my, my um, position. Um, but in hindsight now, I would do things a little bit different and, and you know, I would maybe try and give him a lot more help than I did. Yeah. But to sit down and have a beer with, uh, or a cup of tea with and, and talk footy, he was fantastic. Mm. I can't say a bad word about John. He, um, he gave me an opportunity um, and I love working with him. And what did you see from him that you thought, you know, I might take that and put my spin on that? Funny enough, I, 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 never, I never took anything from another coach. I always yeah. was my own person and, and some could say that I wasn't technical enough. To me, that's rubbish because I could have been. 
I yeah. could have been I could have been like a school teacher coach and been quite technical. I wasn't. I used to like to create an atmosphere that players used to like playing in to bring the best out of them. And and that was my go. And um John, he he, he, he was similar, but he had that Australian hard nosed bull-nosed mm, attitude. The hype in and around the place. Uh, what do you remember of 1995, before you even kicked the ball off? Mm. What was it like? Because the whole country just went off. Yeah, well, the hype was created by our CEO, Ian Robson. <laughs> I mean, he was... He was good. He, he was one of the best speakers I've ever heard. I mean, he could he could capture a room just by talking. He was six foot six, and he was a very articulate speaker. Done a great job. Um, and he got the hype going, and oh, gee, you know, the, the, I mean, you can, not that I saw a lot of it before the games, but you, you know, I've seen cl film clips of it since about the, uh, the events that happened, and you know, the war games at Mount Smart and all this, you know, they had so much pre-game entertainment, and, um, and that, that made people interested, you know, people were coming with their families, mm. and that was the good thing about it. Some of the players came through from your Canterbury days, domestic days. Let's talk about Fitzy Tyra for a moment because I mean he was in the, the, the starting 17 uh, and he was, a, he was a wonderful player, he was a wonderful man and probably defied odds to be in that starting, starting team with a lot of big names. What did you like about Fitzy? I liked him not just as a player but as a person. Uh, he, 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 had, he was a really lovely bloke and still is. Um, but he was, a, he was a great winger and he, I can never remember Fitzy Tyra playing a bad game. He had that left foot um, step and he beat players, he used to score a lot of tries. And he, he was a funny little bugger. I mean, he, 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 we called him Possum. That was his yeah. nickname because he always come out at night, you know, and he didn't know when to go to bed. But he, he was great company and, uh, and a great player. Frank, you were the first coach to take a team to grand finals. 1996 mm. reserve grade grand final. Mm. The first time the club had ever been playing for anything. We went in against Sharks side that had won three finals in a row, three mm. grand finals in mm. a row, and we were the major underdogs. And I think we got beat by two points, 16-14 from memory. Um, and we were very, very unlucky. Doc Murray scored the try that would have won us the grand yeah, final. Yeah. And the referee went to blow it for the try. And there was a, a touch judge who was well known to everyone, especially Gus Gould. Oh, yes. And his name was Martin Weeks. Yeah. Bald headed fella. He came running on with the flag and they ruled out the try that cost us a grand final. So I don't know where he come out with that one, but Gus Gould had a whole chapter about him in his book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was yeah. known for it yeah. and he, he, he done us. But you know, that's, that's life. You get the good ones, you get the bad ones. I think for me, watching those players come through from reserve grade and playing test football and first grade football for the Warriors, that was the best thing that I got out of the game. You know, you, you never forget. You never forget. I still see them today and, and have a beer yeah. with them, and it, it, it's it's so it's you know it's so good. Yeah. Um, and I'll never forget those times. Well, you you showed your credentials in '96 and before that with Canterbury, um, but this time in 1997 was your chance. Uh, it was mid-season. Did you see it coming? Did you have any idea? And w when was the moment knowing that you could step up and, and be the man, the big dog? It happened when there was a change of um, CEO. Bill McGowan, Bill mm. McGowan, our old mate, bless him. He, he, he came over to Townsville with us. We were playing the Cowboys. And he asked me out for a cup of tea in the morning. The match was later in the afternoon. And I said, oh, yeah, it's good. Well, so we went out in the main street and we sat down and had a cup of tea. And he said that they were about to sack John um, and um, they wanted me to take over. And I thought, oh, geez, you know, I've always wanted to take over, but not in this fashion. No. And I... Um, but it was either say yes or they'd get someone else. Um, so, um, yeah, reluctantly, I, I said yes, and, uh, and John was gone, and, um, you know, pretty quick. And uh, I took over halfway through 97. It was still in the Super League era. Yeah, yeah. Well, why do you think that was? Because, I mean, John was on a 50% winning percentage when he left the club. Why was it? Was it to do with the players? Yeah, there was a fallout between, as I said earlier, with, with the players and John. Um, mm. And that was unfortunate because the, the players were rumbling and, and, you know, we were all hearing the rumbles. But I was hoping I wasn't hearing them, but mm. they were there. And, um, and I, I believe since that a lot of those players actually went to the CEO and, and said to him, look, we've had enough of them. You know? So that was, um, it was unfortunate. It yeah. was really unfortunate. Um, and at the time, of course, it was Super League. There were 10 teams and we were last on the ladder. 
when we were 10th. So how, how long did you have to plan and prep for your, your first game, put your first squad together, and what did you do knowing Frank and camaraderie being a big thing? I think, remember, the first game was against the Broncos. Mm. Um, and, you know, with the, the Alfie Langers and all the guns, and oh, they, they had the best team about in those Absolutely. days. And I picked the first New Zealand team ever. Full 1 to 17? 1 to 17 New Zealand. Okay. And you can check that out in the records. There was no Englishmen. They were there, but I didn't pick them. And there was no Aussies. I just picked this full Kiwi team because I wanted to see some of these young blokes play and, and, and give them the opportunity. After two minutes, we were up 6-0 with a short and hoppy try. Mm. And uh, I thought, oh, this is, this, is, this is going good. But, you know, we got beaten that game. But, boy, gee, I tell you what, the, st the crowd actually stood up and clapped them off the, um, off the pitch. Obviously, yeah, you had all these good Aussies in, in Palmer, so you had to, yeah, at some stage, you had to bring them in and then fine. But, you know, I tried to play as many Kiwis as I could. But also there's World Club Challenge as well that was in and amongst it. Uh, what do you remember of the World Club Challenge? Because the club did well, man. Yeah, we were really the success team in the whole tournament, the World Tournament. Um, we went to England and played uh, Warrington, St Helens and Bradford, who were the top three teams over there. And we thrashed all of them. Yeah. Um, really, really give it to them. Um, and then we played them over here. And I think we put 60 on St Helens and 60 on Bradford. Yeah and played Warrington on the coldest day of the year at Christchurch and beat them by about 18. So we made the semi-finals and we were unlucky to draw the Brisbane Broncos in Brisbane. Mm. And we only, I think we only went under 18-12 and it was mostly the best game we'd played all year. It yeah. was a, I was really proud of them that night. They were brilliant. I mean, it's one thing to coach a team week in, week out here uh, in New Zealand and go across a ditch, but to go on tour in England, uh, man, it must have been some good times. Memories of that and maybe some characters uh, even some stories over there, perhaps, Frank. Oh, there's too many. Some you can talk about, some you can't. I remember Mark Ellis. <laughs> Mark Ellis is one of the best characters ever. Oh, I, yeah. I, I love Mark. I loved him as a bloke, and, and he, was a, he was a good player too. Don't worry about that. But um, he had had a um, broken nose over there, and, um, and I give him the message at half time in front of the team. I mean, normally I don't do that, but I... Well, you gave him a spray. Up, I give him a good spray. Yeah. I said, you know, you're not here for your looks, you're here to play rugby league, you know, you got to have a nose like mine. I said, you know, get out there. And that. Well, he went out there and um, anyway, the next game, I picked him for the next game and he was he was still worried about his TV face. <laughs> and he came up with a hamstring injury yeah. Yeah. and kept him out the next couple of games. So I didn't realise that at the time, but apparently apparently coming from him, he used a hamstring yeah, as an yeah. excuse for his nose. But he, he a great guy. He was a great character. And I remember the game we also played at Warrington. And the players were sending the message through our runners, there was something wrong with the foot every time they got the football, that it was slippery. So what it was, the Warrington ball boys were trained up that they had two balls here, one for Warrington, yeah, and the other one with the scene you would have come across this in England, yeah. and the old slippery ball that was thrown into us and <laughs> would pass and drop it on the first tackle. So we had to sort that out too. But uh, these are all things you put yeah. up with in the hot dressing rooms, of course, with the heat and all the rest. They, they, you know, they turn the heat up to uh, anything to win, win at all costs. The very next year, 1998, you get a... a a full season, you get the pre-season with your squad, there were some really good buys and I want to get your opinion on that. Uh, Tony Tupu and Nigel Whangana come home. Quinton Pongia, uh, may he rest in love up there, a wonderful player. He, he was mostly the toughest player ever coach, um, certainly one of them. And uh, you know, when he, when he passed it was just like losing a part of yourself, you know. He, uh, he was the cornerstone of the uh, of, of the pack every time he took the field, and, and, and the Australians hated playing against him. They hated it, and um, and you still hear the comments today. You know, they say who's the toughest player you ever played against? They say Quinton Ponga. Mm. Um, you know, we had some tough ones, and Ruben Wicky and yourself, and and, and, and and many others. We had tough forwards, but by gee, he just stood out. You know, he wasn't the mm. biggest in the world, but he had the biggest heart. And, um, you know, he could throw a punch. I've, oh, yeah. <laughs> I've seen it. And uh, he was underrated, Nigel. He, he was a try-scoring machine. He was just one of those players that could turn a game. And uh, his line running was as good as you get. Mm. He'd hit a ball at 100 mile an hour and, and, and hit the hole every time. And he just knew how to finish. He knew how to finish. And uh, a great asset to the team. Tony was, he was just one of those guys. He, to me, he was a freak. Yeah. And... Um, John Money used to call him the lurker 
because he's what's he lurking around for? But he'd always come up with that big play that could win you a game. And I remember he won a game for us um, against Melbourne Storm at Olympic Park, um, and after the Hooter, after the Hooter, and uh, Stacey Jones, the Hooter win, he had the ball on the sideline, kicked it up and under the post and out to Tupu, and, he, and, and Tony scored, and we won the game. Tony goes like that for a while. <laughs> oh yeah, and, and he, he puts the ball down yeah, eventually. That's it. And he beat Melbourne Storm and it was for the trophy and I was had Stace on here the other day yeah. and I was teasing him because I was his uh, roommate at the time, I was 18th man, yeah. I was running the water. Yeah. And um, and then let's just say the next day, Stace would um, train hard, play hard and party hardest. A wonderful player and a big part of the Warriors the whole time and, and the GOAT for me. Yeah, me too, uh, without a doubt. I, I mean, you know, he, Stacey's got to be with the club to the day he dies, he's got to be. He, 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 so many people respect him on that, but oh, he's done some funny things, or, you know, some like can talk about someone like that, but he, uh, he, he always liked to celebrate uh, with, a, with a good drink after a game, Stacey. And after we beat Melbourne Storm in Melbourne, that was a big win for us, and, and after the Hooter, and um, we went to the casino that night, you know, yep. and um, and I, I remember turning around and there's Stacey running up the escalator the wrong way with two <laughs> security guards after him. <laughs> we're going to stash no more. We're not going to say any more stuff. I had to walk him. I had to walk him home like a little boy. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, I, I remember that. Yeah, I, oh, I remember was, you escorting yeah, him out. I had and to. Then, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was uh, funny. He but was, it was all harmless, of course. It was harmless. Oh, so yeah. Fine. Oh, there was no malice in it whatsoever. It was, it was just fun. You did care for your players, and there's nothing that illustrated that more than a moment one night in Canberra. <laughs> uh, you want to talk to me about that one, mate? I don't think it's been spoken about on TV before. Yeah, well, you obviously want to know about it. So, yeah, that was back in uh, in the days we, we flew over there and, and played um, Canberra Raiders. And after the game, uh, we we decided to go and have a drink together as a team at um, a certain nightclub. And uh, and I'll cut this story short, but um, ended up in a pretty big blue, uh, and, and ended up in the in the back alley of of this bar, and. Uh, I just happened to be in the middle of it and um, you know it was just like the old times so no one will ever say to me that I, I didn't stick up for me players because I was swinging as much as them and if, if it ever come out I would have been look I would have been sacked on the spot it, yeah. it, you know if it was now you, you wouldn't get away with it but but it wasn't your fault you, you were in, well, uh, in an establishment and yeah, uh, yeah. Sean Hoppy was, was trying to play a game of pool and then someone oh. didn't like the fact that he was a very good looking man yeah, and there yeah. was all on yeah no it was and there were some pretty big boys that we were up against too but uh, they did come second that night yeah. and I'm just going to say so I heard that you went around this side to try and see what was happening and <laughs> <laughs> the big man, Hytra Orcasini, went with you, but he actually tripped over and knocked himself out, so he was no help. Well, we couldn't get out through the bar because there were so many there. They were they were firing up down the other end. We couldn't get through. So I said to Hytro, let's go around through the, the front door and, and, and down the, the side street and yeah. into the alley. And I we were running around there, and I heard this thud, and I turned around, and he's tripped over a grate in the footpath and knocked himself out. So it <laughs> so was no good. So I looked, and I thought, well... He's not going to be any good for us, so I, I, I left him there on the sidewalk and went into the alley, and here they were, there's about 20 odd of them into it, so I just happened yeah. to jump in like a madman, I was a bit mad in those days. Because I also <laughs> there was a, a taxi there, and some got in the taxi to get away, and then you thought, you know what, I, I had a professional boxer as a father, <laughs> I'm just going to see what I can do. The apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. Yeah, yeah no, it, it was just more from the players, I, I didn't want, you know, they were up against some pretty big boys, actually, and um, I didn't... Uh, and pull cues and everything being used, and I, I just didn't want to see any of them injured, so um, I just went in to do a little bit to help. <laughs> All right, another special moment when you're at the club was when you get to coach your son. Um, probably Shane didn't think it was so special sometimes because you were probably a little bit too hard on him, uh, but that's that's a great moment to have with your son, great, great memories and a bond. It was, it was, but I never got that good feeling out of it because I treated him as another player. And, and not as that special bond, you know. It, it should have been, uh, but it wasn't. Funny enough, a lot of people thought that I signed him, but I didn't. I didn't know he was coming to the club. John Ackman actually signed him and t uh, put it to John Money, and he said, yep, we'll take him. And he mm. proved a success in reserve grade and because he ended up, I think, playing about 44 games, I think, in NRL, yeah. and, uh, in NRL and another six in the World Club Challenge. So you know, he, was, he was a good, consistent and honest player. And um, yeah, it was, yeah, oh, I'm 
I'm pleased he reached those heights because he deserved it. Absolutely. He's a great guy to be around as well because I remember being in the squads with him and he always had time for you. Mm. And he would always, oh, yeah, always be yeah. that way. Yeah, he's, he's that sort of bloke. He's got a good heart. Um, he's been brought up that way and he thinks more of others than he does himself. Mm. But he could, have been a, a, he could have been twice the player. He had, uh, a lot of people didn't realise that he, he couldn't do too, ma too many weights because he had a, uh, a spine dislodgement oh, in okay. the spine and he could never load his weights and, and that um, that had a bearing on it. Um, okay, so you went from a 10-team competition to a 20-team competition because they had Adelaide Rams, they had um, Perth, so mm. it, was a, it was a hard schedule because you had to do a lot of travel, mm. there was a lot to do. Uh, what, what do you make of 1998 in that year, your, your first year in charge and unfortunately your, your only year? I thought it was the most enjoyable year I had. I, I, I didn't want it to finish, you know, mm. I mean when, when you know, Graham and Lowe and the Tainui took the club over. I, I understood that they wanted their own people there. That, that's life. You know, that's that, that's the way it goes. But I was, I reckon I was just coming right as a coach when that happened. Um, it, you know, and we finished, we, we didn't finish in the top eight or anything like that. But everyone, and I remember Gordon Tallis, the tough Australian forward. Mm. I remember him saying on TV, you know, he said, whether you beat the Warriors or not, you always lose the following week. Yeah. He said they knock you around so much. Yeah. And that's the way we played. Uh, we, we were a physical side. Um, I think we got some very, very raw deals with the refereeing at that stage. And that's, no, that's not whinging, that's a fact. No. There were about five or six games we lost by a point or two points. And I tell you what, they were wins in my book. And, yeah. and that, that was the difference between making the finals and not. Um, you know, they, they still say about the refereeing decision, they, mate, they don't know how well off they are at the moment, right. the Warriors, yeah. compared with those days. They were terrible. And the Super League war brought it out, unfortunately. Yeah. But uh, we had some great players in that team, and um, I really enjoyed it. Really, really enjoyed it. Now, Frank, uh, in that Super League era and coaching the boys, it wasn't an easy job, right? Because no, normally yeah. a lot of people say they want to play for the love of the game, but it wasn't that case then, was it? No, it's a good point you make because um, the money around that was being thrown around was just unbelievable. Unbelievable. I mean, I saw the pay packets. I know what they were getting paid and it was huge money. Um, and it changed the discussion to the players because I know when we go to Australia every week and we're having, every second week, and we're having breakfast or we're having dinner and we're sitting around a table together with mm. the players and we used to talk about football. You know, who we gonna, how are we going to do this and how are we going to... You know, when Super League come, I'd sit there and listen to the conversation. It was who was going to buy the best car or the biggest mm. boat, you know, and the money. It was all about greed. And I really, I, that was the period, at that period when that was the, the Super League, which I thought ruined our game uh, over here. Um, thank goodness it's come right since. I can always put up my hand, look you in the eye and say, I never took a, a, a cent of Super League money. Yeah. Uh, I didn't. Um, the, the offers were there. Uh, I, 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 I didn't take it, and um, I, I'm pleased now I didn't. Since you were there from the start, uh, many years on, uh, what does this club mean to you? It means everything, you know, it means everything. I, I want to see them win a, a grand final before they cark it. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> you know, and, uh, they, they get this, I don't care who coaches them, uh, they'll always have my support. The players will always have the support. I get frustrated like you do and everyone else does when they, when they don't perform. but. I'll stick with them on the roller coaster, on the high spots and the, and the low spots. And um, to be a good fan, you've got to do that. You've got to take the hits. And, um, you know, I, I'm just waiting for that day where they start winning plenty in a row and they make, those, uh, make the final and win it. Once a warrior, always a warrior, Frank. Thank you so much for being happy, Frank, and making so many other people in and around you at the club and as fans happy too for your time. A pleasure, Monty. Thanks so much, mate. I'm on to be them. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next week.